Introducing Bill Martin. He's a comparative microbial physiologist. He works in Dusseldorf. He's a, an American and a German. And he's very interested in the origin of life at hydrothermal vents, as in this paper, and the origin of not just life, but of biochemistry at hydrothermal vents, and just and the origin of cells in general. He also is very interested in how did the last universal common ancestor make a living? And that's what this paper is about. And he's also interested in the phylogeny of chloroplasts and plastids. Well, I sat down with him in Tokyo, and I asked him, Bill, are we alone? My name is Bill Martin. And uh, what do you do? I'm a professor from molecular evolution at the University of Dusseldorf. All right. And are we alone in the universe? Depends on who you would count as a neighbor or as a, as a we. Okay, um, what do you, the, the, when the, I asked you the question, what did you understand by the word we? Well, I've heard this question before. Some people think intelligent life, somebody we could talk to, somebody uh -huh. that would fly a spaceship, uh -huh. and other people think uh, some, any form of life in general, right? Carbon-based life, things that are alive and growing. And I would say that the, if you ask me, I'd say the chances that we have life, that is microbes, somewhere else in the universe is almost certain, and the chance that we have intelligent life is probably pretty good. Pretty good. Wait, why do you say that? There's something, I think it's called the Drake Equation. Mm -hmm. It gives some probability. It just, it's a numbers game. There are just so many planets and so many stars and so much Right. material in the universe that regardless of how improbable the event, the sequence of events might seem that lead to intelligent life, it was possible on Earth. That we have proof, right? We have evidence that it is possible, and if it's possible here, it's possible somewhere else. And then, okay, now how about the, you and I are speaking the English language here. Right. We can study the origin of the English language, it's possible here, but very few people would think that any alien would speak English. They're thinking so clearly. They're, they are thinking clearly. It's very <laughs> unlikely. So that, there's a counter. That it's very <laughs> unlikely that it's in the movies they come out and can right. speak English. But okay. there's a, what I'm saying <laughs> is that's a counterexample to the idea of if it happened here, it should or could happen somewhere else. Well, you've got a point there, but um, the verbalization, okay, we've got intelligent life here on this planet, uh, and I don't know how many different languages we have among humans. Just one language. I don't know, maybe a hundred, maybe more basic languages, and that indicates to me that this is, um, that the, once one has intelligence, that the, uh, the probability to, uh, of, of finding, or the um, the um, uh, threshold of evolving a language is very low, and that means that the chances that you'll get the same one twice are very low. Life is a chemical reaction. Okay. I'll repeat that one. Different kinds of chemical reactions. Yeah, I will repeat that one. Life is a chemical reaction. Furthermore, mm -hmm. all forms of life that we know are uh, energy releasing chemical reactions okay. because if we don't release energy okay. we will not take place okay. and what it is astounding that all forms of life that we know today from the bacteria in my gut to the bacteria at the bottom of the ocean to the bacteria that live in the crust and the archaea that live in the crust and okay. the archaea that live in my gut and me and you we are all descendants of one and the same energy releasing chemical reaction that took place on the early earth. And so from, in my view, the origin of life is the question of transition from a pre-existing geochemical reaction on the early earth to one that is compartmentalized and catalyzed in such a way as it makes a copy of itself. Nonetheless, the, and so, so for all the chemical reactions that we know, that for, for us it's uh, oxidizing amino acids and lipids and sugars in our mitochondria with the help of oxygen to generate ATP, the universal energy currency, uh, and that drives all other processes in the cell, right, on using that energy currency. That's true for all cells that we know. 
Okay? They, have, or they all have that. Viruses don't have that. But all cells that we know, they have this property. And, uh, it's, but it's not oxygen. The reaction is not lipids and sugars and amino acids and oxygen. There are many different kinds of chemical reactions that are energy releasing that can, uh, that can be used to generate this, uh, uh, to generate chem useful chem chemical energy in the form of ATP. Uh, my personal opinion is that the ancestral state, the most ancient form of chemical reaction uh, that cells use is the is harnessing the redox energy, the chemical energy in the H2CO2 couple. That is hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, reacting with carbon dioxide. This is a reaction that is harnessed both by primitive bacteria. They're called acetogens. They take hydrogen and CO2 and convert it into acetate. That's their main energy yielding. Uh, reaction, exorganic, re that's their chemical reaction. They, they make acetate for a living and from the energy that's released in making acetate they gain ATP. Where do these organisms live today? Anywhere where it's strictly anaerobic and there's hydrogen and CO2. For example? <laughs> termite guts. Termite guts, how? Termite guts, Hydrothermal uh, rumen, uh, and hydrothermal vents and the Earth's crust. I'm interested in the life that exists on Earth and its biochemical mechanisms and processes, similarity to those processes to, to spontaneous processes going on at hydrothermal vents and that can be um, simulated in wonderful, simple ways in the laboratory. And um, so if we say, I, but Dr. Martin, you're, you're investigating life and is that not astrobiology? Well, in that sense, the Earth is in space, so mm -hmm. it is, it's a definition, but I would not consider myself an astrobiologist because astrobiologists are concerned about, you know, life on other heavenly bodies. Mm -hmm. um, you and, mentioned Encellus. I, indeed, I did, because it re reflects um, a chemistry that I think from the study of life on Earth mm -hmm. could have given rise to life on Earth, mm -hmm. and therefore that chemistry is relevant mm -hmm. and interesting. And of course, what NASA is doing, mm -hmm. rightly or not rightly so, is they're selling their space program, the exploration of these, these uh, deep territories, not in order to have better mining capabilities or to bring strange gases back from other planets, mm -hmm. but looking for life. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is that people want to know, mm -hmm. right? This, this is something that- But that, you don't want to know? I'm busy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm too busy to well, ask that question. Well, we've, we've got enough to do. I've got my hands full right. with the things that we can see here on Earth. All right, let me and stop when, you. When, stop I'm, done if, that, when right. I'm done with that, I'll worry about the stuff so on I other planets. So I've asked you if,